Uh, Joe said it's not necessary to be a member of College Park to go to heaven. I get that. <laughs> How many of you, however, have never been to the Moody Church? Could I see your hands? For... <gasps> this is scary. <laughs> it's, not, it's not necessary to visit Moody Church to go to heaven. I get that. <laughs> but why take a chance? I'm sitting down this morning because uh, I have two sessions that I have to teach. I said to my lovely wife, Rebecca, I said, honey, I don't look 75, do I? She said, no, no, you don't, but you used to. <laughs> <laughs> so that's my story, and I'm sticking with it. And so if all of you guys are sitting, I'm sitting. In fact, I'm going to sit in such a way I can even see the front row. Not possibly as well as God does, but we're here, all right? Thank you for joining me here on the journey. We're going to have such a great time. You know, you really ought to call somebody. I know, don't use your cell phones right now, but you ought to really call somebody and invite them, even if they're at the second session, because we're going to... Oh, I, I can hardly wait. We're going to be talking about... Uh, the Swiss Reformation, uh, Swingley, the drowning of the Anabaptists, Calvin. Oh, what a great time we're going to have. And today, right now, the greatest of all times, my favorite, a guy you'd love to have dinner with because he was so witty, sometimes earthy, full of faults like huge faults, and that is Martin Luther, my favorite, and we're going to begin there is a story, I assume it is apocryphal, that uh, when Pope Paul died, by the way, if you're here today as a Catholic, not only do I welcome you, welcome you to listen, but I also hope right now that you have a sense of humor. <laughs> because when Pope Paul died, he was trying to get into the door of heaven, and his key wouldn't fit. You know, he, was, you know he, he just couldn't get the thing to work. And a shadowy figure walked by, and Pope Paul said, What is this? I'm the guy who has the keys to the kingdom, and my key won't fit. The guy said, You have to understand something. 500 years ago, a guy by the name of Martin Luther came up here and changed the locks. Now, you have to understand that more books have been written about Martin Luther than any man who ever lived except Jesus and Paul, and yet there are some Christians who have never read a biography of Luther. Well, your best biography summarized for you is Rescuing the Gospel, <laughs> all right? The book that all of you should have by now. Rescuing the Gospel, this afternoon after the Q&A, we're going to talk about rescuing the gospel in America. And, uh, but this is Rescuing the Gospel, the Story and the Significance of the Reformation, and your church is subsidizing it so that you can get it for a very, very low cost. And I'll be reading snippets from it once in a while because <laughs> it is a good book. <laughs> <laughs> a little bit of humor there. A little bit of humor and a lot of truth. <laughs> How are you all doing? Martin Luther, there was nothing in his background to suggest greatness. Born in Eisleben, Germany in 18, excuse me, 1483. And uh, he was attending university in Erfurt, hoping to become a lawyer, to earn some money for the family. When he was walking home one day and at Stotterheim, Germany, he was struck down by lightning. And he called out and said, help me, Saint Anne, and I shall become a monk. And so in order to fulfill his vow, but more importantly, to find peace for his soul, he enrolled in the Augustinian Monastery, now in Erfurt, Germany. I've been in the monastery many times because it's been my privilege to lead tours to the sites of the Reformation. I've seen the, room, uh, the rooms in which he slept, hard floors. Because in those days it was believed that... Um, Salvation came, you had to make yourself worthy of grace. Salvation was of grace, but you had to make yourself worthy. Luther was plagued by what is known in German as Anfechtungen. 
Oh boy, you have to pronounce that correctly. Anfechtungen, a sense of existential despair, alienation from God, guilt, depression. The question was, how am I going to make myself worthy enough for God to accept me? So he availed himself of the disciplines of the church, scant diet, also rough clothes, begging, sleeping on the floor without blankets in order to mortify the flesh, to do everything that he possibly could do to please God enough so that he would be worthy enough to be saved. The problem was no matter what he did, it was never enough. And um, he had his first mass. The very table where Luther had his first mass is actually still there in the Augustinian monastery. He said later that he expected possibly to be struck down by God. Who am I, a pygmy, pygmy in God's sight, that I should be able to take ordinary bread and turn it into the body of Christ and ordinary wine and turn it into the literal blood of Christ. You see, Luther understood that God was holy. And the question was, how do you appease a God who is holy above your ability to even conceive his holiness? Confession was of some solace to him. But sometimes he confessed his sins up to six hours at a time. He would begin confession by reciting the seven deadly sins, the Ten Commandments, to jog his memory. And then the confession would begin. His confessor Staupitz was so exasperated and said, Luther, the next time you to come to confess, don't come and confess all these little peccadillos, all these little sins. Confess something big like murder and adultery, but not all these little sins. But Luther was a better theologian than his contemporaries. He knew that the issue was not whether the sin was big or little, but whether or not it had been confessed and forgiven, because Luther understood that the smallest smidgen of sin can cut you off from God and will cut you off from God forever. So the confessions continued. But he reached an impasse. Think it through. This is a think conference. Think it through. Sins, in order to be forgiven, had to be confessed. If they were not remembered, of course, they could not be confessed, and therefore they would not be forgiven. And then Luther discovered something that was even worse. His whole nature was corrupt. Let's suppose that uh, he remembered all of his sins and confessed all of his sins, and, and he did that. Tomorrow would be another day with brand new sins. It was like mopping up a floor with a faucet running. In the Mass, for example, your past sins are taken care of, but what about your future sins? Those future sins, they need to be taken care of at another time, I guess, at the next Mass, because, because all that it is is a process of unending struggle and wonder without a certain... Um, certain ending. So there he was. Now, the church did have some, uh, re uh, some means to rescue people like Luth Luth <laughs> Luther. Yeah, Luther and Luther are distinct. I have gotten letters to Dr. Luther, and I understand why, but Luther is different than Luther. <laughs> so anyway, in those days, it was believed that there was such a thing as the merit of the saints. There were some saints who did more good than they'd have needed to to get to heaven, and therefore they had a surplus, especially the Virgin Mary. So what you could do is to draw on that surplus by uh, seeing a relic, by paying a gift, by doing something like that, and uh, then from that point of, uh, point of view, uh, you would be able to continue to hope that you would accumulate, accumulate enough merit so that you would eventually make it into heaven. Now the problem was that, uh, again, it was something that was uncertain. In 1510, Martin Luther went to Rome. Now if you know the distance between, uh, between Erfurt and Rome, I've traveled it by bus, it is a huge area. It would, you know, up hills and valleys. He and two other monks walked. And they stayed in monasteries along the way. And then he got to Rome. 
and he thought, at last in Rome I shall find peace for my soul. But he discovered that there was much ungodliness in Rome. As a matter of fact, the priests made fun of what they were doing. Uh, they would say sarcastically, bread thou art, and bread thou forever shalt be. Wine thou art, and wine thou shalt be. And they would whisper these things, even as they were standing in line to do one mass after another. Luther came back and said that uh, regarding Rome, if um, there is a hell, Rome was built on it. He's not the first person to talk about the corruption of Rome at that time. There were others like Erasmus who had the very same experience as Luther. And so he, he's there in Rome. He goes up the stairs that supposedly are the stairs of Pilate's judgment hall, saying prayers on each one, and he gets to the top and says, Can it be so? How much more do I have to do to please God? Staupitz said to him, Luther, there's a new university that's beginning in Wittenberg. The Elector Frederick is beginning this university, and what he needs is some young professors. I suggest that you go there. Luther went there and taught Aristotelian ethics, and uh, Staupitz said, what you have to do is you have to begin to teach the Bible. Luther said, if I teach the Bible, that shall be the death of me. And uh, in some sense it was. He began to teach and he gets to Psalm 22. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Now says Luther, Jesus is experiencing what I am experiencing. This sense of alienation from God. This, this sense of despair, this sense of, of depression. Why would he experience that? And it began to dawn on him, Jesus had done that for him. And then as all of you know, as every Christian who's been saved six months knows, I sometimes live in the world of fantasy, uh, Luther began to lecture on the book of Romans. He comes to chapter 1, verse 16, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to all who believe, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. And in it, the righteousness of God is made manifest from faith to faith as it is written, the just shall live by faith. Now, says Luther, I ponder day and night between the connection that the just shall live by faith and the fact that the righteousness of God is revealed from heaven. And then he continued to study the book of Romans. He gets to chapter 4, where it says Abraham was justified by faith because he believed. And in chapter 5, where it says that there is the free gift of righteousness given to those that believe. Now, said Luther, I understand. There is a righteousness that belongs to God as an attribute, but there is also a righteousness that he gives to those who believe. That righteousness is credited to those who believe. Well, now, said Luther, when I understood that, that if I would grasp by faith what God did in Jesus, because when Jesus died on the cross, he got what he didn't deserve, namely our sin, and we get what we don't deserve, namely his righteousness. Now, said Luther, that means then it is as if I went through the gates of paradise. I want to say that those of you who attend church tomorrow here, and I'm going to be speaking on faith alone, I'm going to be rehearsing just a few of these ideas to get the context for faith alone as we tease that out in more detail, because this is critical, that through faith he would receive it. Luther said, did I love God during those days in the monastery? I hated him. And I hated him because he was too holy and impossible for human beings to appease. But now, said Luther, now that I understand the gospel and I receive by faith the gift of righteousness, it is credited to me. I am declared as righteous as God, thanks to the righteousness of God credited to my account. Now Luther said, it doesn't matter how high God's standard is as long as I don't have to meet it. 
as long as, as Jesus meets it. 24 hours a day, God demands perfection if I'm to have fellowship with him. 24 hours a day, God supplies, Jesus supplies what God demands. Amen. It's okay to say amen here. It was a weak clapping, but you know, <laughs> later on when we talk about Calvin, many of you may not be elect, I don't know. <laughs> so he understood that this righteousness was a gift. It was a gift, it had to be. It was the kind of righteousness of which you and I have none. We cannot add to it, we cannot subtract to it, from it. It is righteousness. And uh, it led to something else too, and that is the priesthood of the believer. You know, if, if the believer is righteous, he can come to God through Christ on his own and doesn't need a priest. Meanwhile, in Rome, uh, there was a man by the name of Pope Leo. Pope Leo loved hunting. Uh, he was uh, not a righteous pope. Catholic authorities agree to that. You can look at any Catholic encyclopedia. And he wanted to finish St. Peter's Basilica that you see on the news. Uh, and the tears were laid by a previous pope by the name of Pope Julius. And now the question was, how do we finish St. Peter's Basilica? So in order to gain money, he began to sell indulgences throughout Germany and other territories. Now you must understand that an indulgence is something granted by the church that says that you are free from all temporal penalties, free from all temporal penalties of your sin. God, God alone actually can forgive you, but you are free from temporal penalties of sin. So they have had a long history in the church. They continue in uh, the Catholic Church. As you know, when Pope Francis went to Brazil, it said on the website of the Vatican, if you follow him in all of his religious observances, you can have a plenary indulgence. That is a complete indulgence. What was new was this. You not only now had to pay for an indulgence, which had been done historically before, but you could also have an indulgence that you could purchase for the dead. So guys like Tetzel, Vendors like Tetzel came into a town square, held up the cross that they brought, and said that this cross is equivalent to the cross of Christ. And if you buy an indulgence for your mother, she will be freed. And so there was this little jingle that he used, which roughly from the German can be translated, as soon as the coin hits the chest, another soul flies to its heavenly rest. These indulgences were not sold in Wittenberg because the Elector Frederick had his own indulgence trade and didn't want the competition. But the Germans went over the Elbe River and they went to these towns and they bought indulgences and they came back and they showed them to Luther. Some of them even bought indulgences for sins they had not yet committed but planned to commit. <laughs> so they got an indulgence in advance. Luther saw this and became angry. And that was the reason why he walked the half mile, and it is about a half mile actually, walked the half mile from his home there in Wittenberg to the castle church door. There are two churches in, uh, in Wittenberg, believe it or not, two beautiful churches. And he walked there and he nailed his 95 theses. Now, I don't want you to uh, have to worry about what all the theses said, but... Um, uh, for example, I, I'm just choosing a few. Verse thir number 32, those who believe they can be certain of their salvation because they have indulgence letters will be eternally damned together with their teachers. On and on it went. They were written in Latin, and Luther intended that they be debated among the intelligentsia, among the university faculty there in Wittenberg. But someone translated them into German, Gutenberg had invented the printing press the previous, the previous century, and soon they were all throughout Germany. All the Germans were reading him, and they were saying, Jawohl, das ist ja gut. Yes, that is good. We're sick and tired of paying taxes to the Pope. We're sick and tired of all of the shackles of the church. 
it's time somebody spoke out. It is said later that 90% of the people were on Luther's side and the other 10% were shouting death to the Pope. I think that if you do the math, you'll figure out that, you know, when it comes to mathematics, as I've always said, as long as I'm right 90% of the time, I mean, who cares about the other 5%? (laughs) But the point is that suddenly Luther becomes famous. And so uh, he has to enter into various debates. Uh, He has a number of different debates, and uh, these debates are taking place in different ways and in different uh, areas of the country, and Luther is famous. He debates in Leipzig. I told you yesterday that when he was there in Leipzig debating Eck, uh, somebody said, you're a Hussite, and he said no, and then they brought him a book And the debate took place over a period of days, and Luther read Huss's book and said, I am a Hussite. After that, Luther's theology began to develop, and he began to churn out one book after another. I do not know how he did it. He must not have had television. (laughs) If you see all of Luther's writings on a shelf, you know, back in the days before you could put it all on your computer, if you could say it like that, I mean, it's three or four feet of books, commentaries on almost every book of the Bible, books about this, books about that. Unbelievable. And he began to write books, and one which I'll skip because it it involves things that are far too fascinating. Uh, The other one, he, he writes a book, for example, indicating that there are only two sacraments and not seven. That's going to become important for the English Reformation, as we'll explain uh, in the second session, or the third, or whenever. The point is that he begins to churn this out, and suddenly Luther is front-page news. Eventually, the Pope excommunicates Luther, because Luther, uh, initially the Pope said, Luther is a drunken German. He He will feel differently when he is sober. Now, Luther drank. Katie made him some very good beer, which he loved, but he... um, never did change his mind. He never did think differently. So what you have is the papal excommunication. Now, students, if you're here and you're a college student, you can relate to this, okay? The papal bull, and by the way, the bull has nothing to do with farms or uh, animals or cows or anything. The papal bull, the name actually comes from the Latin. A bulla has to do with lead. It has to do with the fact that it was sealed by the Pope with a lead seal so that they would know that it was uh, authentic. So the papal bull arrives in Wittenberg. It takes almost, uh, boy, I think uh, almost a couple of months to get there from Rome because in those days you didn't have uh, email or some of these things that we have today or even snail mail. And it gets there, but Luther already was told what the contents of the bull were, and so he was writing against it even before it got to Wittenberg. Now, students, here's what happened, okay. The papal bull is burned. You can go today in in Wittenberg to the Elster Gate where the burning took place. I love to take tours there and say, this is where the bull was burned. Here's the point. They took the papal bull and the other documents of the Pope, and they burned them in the fire. And then the chronicler talks about students. They had the whole day off, from university, and um, they had fun all day. They would go through Wittenberg with uh, a, a replica of the bull on pitchforks, and they would be blowing horns. And then, I love this, the chronicler says, and they did all kinds of other pranks that students sometimes like to do. And we can just fill in the details. So Luther is uh, excommunicated. He eventually marries. He marries the woman by the name of Katie, which in itself, incredibly interesting. Well, now here's where it really, really gets critical. Oh, oh, man. There is an emperor by the name of Charles V. Charles V was voted in as the emperor of the Holy Roman Empire. He was a Spaniard. He was an ardent Catholic, and he becomes really huge territory all under his leadership, and his name, as I mentioned, is Charles V. 
He has a problem. He has a huge problem. What is he going to do with Luther? He wants to kill him because that's what you did with heretics. And by the way, he never does get to because of reasons I'll share with you in a few moments. But the point is, he wants to kill Luther, but he knows that if he does it without a hearing, he'll have all the Germans mad at him. And I'll let you know right now that one of the reasons that Charles could never kill Luther is because Charles needed the support of the Lutherans in his war against the Turks because they were circulating Vienna. This was the time of the Ottoman Empire, the rise of the Ottoman Empire, Suleiman the Magnificent. Islam was, the Turks were gobbling up one country after another. Maybe I'll get a chance to tell you some of the things that Luther said about the Turks because he did write a short book about them and because of some misunderstandings and all. But the point is, Charles thinks, I'm going to have a hearing, I'll give him a hearing, and then after the hearing, I'll put him to death, and at least I'll be able to say, well, I gave the guy a chance to recant. So there's lots of dickering going on. Luther is invited to go to Worms to recant. Now, it's spelled W-O-R-M-S. We say Worms. Actually, in German, the W is pronounced like a V, so it's the Diet of Worms. I used to say that there's no, if you're struggling with a diet and you want one that works, try the Diet of Worms. I mean, it'll, <laughs> it'll do. You know, in Chicago, up until this last year, we always had the Cub Diet, and people lost a lot of weight with the Cub Diet. <laughs> they just ate whenever the Cubs would win. <laughs> and... Uh, that didn't apply last year. They gained weight. It didn't work. You know, the Cubs, oh, they have won, and now they are no longer the lovable losers. You know that. I don't know how we're going to identify with them because it used to be a couple of years ago, I remember, according to the Tribune, their pitching machine actually pitched a no-hitter. So, <laughs> so Luther is going to the Diet of Worms. He is asked to come there to recant, but Luther was filled with sarcasm. He says, if I am going to recant, I can do that right here in Wittenberg. I don't have to go there. He says, this shall be my recantation at Worms. Previously, I said the Pope is the vicar of Christ. I now recant. I now say that the Pope is the adversary of Christ and the apostle of the devil. That shall be my recantation at Worms. So here it is. You can go to Worms, Germany today, Worms, and you can see the place where the room, though, the building where the diet took place is no longer there. It was destroyed by Louis XIV. Too bad. One of the great historical events of all time so far as church history is concerned. All right, now. Luther's books are brought before him. Are these his books? Yes. Is he willing to recant them? And he says this. He says, uh, you know, uh, not all of my books are of the same sort. There are things that I wrote in them that even uh, the church agrees with. We can't just summarily recant them all. No, you either recant or you don't recant. We will not discuss these books because the authorities said, that's the problem with heretics. They'll always go back to the Bible. We can't discuss this. <laughs> Seriously. They said, it's just like a heretic to quote scripture. Luther says, give me time to think about it. Let me think about it this evening, and I'll let you know tomorrow. I want everyone who is listening at this point to be silent because we are talking about one of the greatest momentous events of church history. I have no idea what the history of the church would look like if Luther had recanted. But you and I may think, oh, you know, Luther was this brave man. He just went there and he just, he just recanted. And yeah, he was a human being. Let me read to you part of the prayer that he prayed the night before he recanted. Let this sink into your soul. O oh, almighty and everlasting God, how terrible is this world. Behold, it opens its mouth to swallow me up, and I have so little trust in thee. How weak is the flesh, and Satan so strong. O oh God, if it is only in the strength of this world that I must put my trust, it's all over. My last hour has come. 
My condemnation has been pronounced. Do you remember that Luther intended to die if he did not recant? That was the agreement in effect with Charles. Oh God, this is not my work but thine. I have nothing to do here, nothing to contend with with the great ones of the world. I should desire to see my days flow on peacefully and happy, but the cause is thine, and it is a righteous and eternal cause. Oh, God, help me. All that is of man is uncertain. Oh, God, hearest thou me not? God, art thou dead? No, thou canst not die, but thou dost hide thyself. Thou hast chosen me for this work, how I know it well. Act then, O God, stand at my side, for thy sake of thy well-beloved Jesus Christ, who is my defense, my shield, and my strong tower. He goes on and says, Lord, where do you stay? Where are you? And, and he says, when I'm stretched out on the rack, which is how he intended to die, very painfully, are you going to be there for me? So the next day he goes there, there are more people present in that room the second day than there were the first. There's the emperor, Charles, sitting. Here are all of the German princes. Here are people representing the papacy. And Luther is asked once again, will you recant without horns, that is to say, without equivocation, and without trying to say, well, let's separate some of the documents from the other? Will you? Or will you not recant? Now let me tell you something. Everybody in this room and who is listening to this should know by memory what Luther said, and you should be quoting it to your children to give them the idea and the understanding of how courage is needed. Oh, this is huge. I cannot and I will not recant. My conscience is taken captive By the word of God, to go against conscience is neither right nor safe. I will not and I cannot recant. Here stehe ich, ich kann nicht anderes. Here I stand. I can do no other. The room just erupted. Luther said in German, ich bin hindurch, which is to say, I'm out of here. He left the room and he went back to his quarters. You see, the problem was Charles had given Luther safe conduct and Luther knew that that didn't work for us if you were here yesterday. But Charles did want to keep his word to Luther. And so what Charles did is he wrote the Edict of Worms and the Edict of Worms says after Luther goes back to Wittenberg, anyone can kill him without reprisal, but we should let him go back safely because that was my commitment to him. That night, though, a delegation comes to Luther and says, Luther, you have to recant because the church is being torn apart. This seamless robe called Christendom is being ripped to shreds because of you. And Luther said, if I had a thousand heads, I would give them for what I believe. Wow. All right, Luther is going back to Wittenberg. And uh, on his way, he's riding on a wagon, and uh, he's going back, and suddenly some men jump out of the ditch, they overtake the horse, and they overtake Luther, and with much shouting and cursing and fanfare, they capture him, and they hide him in the Wartburg Castle. Now you must understand that the people who captured him were actually the men that belonged to Luther's prince, Frederick, who decided to side with Luther at the Diet of Worms. When uh, Charles, by the way, why was he called the Elector Frederick? He was called the Elector because there were only seven electors and they elected the head of the Holy Roman Empire. And so Luther's prince, the elector Frederick, was a very important man to Charles because he had actually voted in favor of Charles when Charles was put in office as the head of the Holy Roman Empire. So what you have here is something very interesting. The elector Frederick, when the Edict of Worms was written by Charles, the elector Frederick refused to sign it. 
Most of the other electors did, but he didn't. He sided with Luther. So what he did is he told his men, look, I want you to hide in the ditch. I want you to take Luther so that he isn't killed, and we're going to capture him and take him into the Wartburg Castle. And it is there in the Wartburg, in a little room that I've been in many times, maybe 12 feet by 12 feet, maybe a little bigger than your kitchen, but not much, that Luther spent 11 months, and what accomplished in that room was absolutely overwhelming. Uh, first of all, let me talk about the fact that this is the room where tradition says he threw an inkwell at the devil. And uh, tour guides used to rub a little bit of soot on the wall because, you know, you pay so much to go to Germany. <laughs> you have so many steps that you have to climb up. You want to see where the inkwell landed, don't you? <laughs> but listen carefully. I'm not sure that Luther threw an inkwell at the devil. He said in his table talks, I fought the devil with ink. What did he do there in the Wartburg Castle? He translated the entire New Testament into German from the original Greek, and he did it in about 11 weeks of his 11 months that he was there. That's the way you fight the devil. There's no devil that says, oh, look at that inkwell. Ooh, it, almost, it almost hit me, no. <laughs> You want to fight the devil? You fight him with ink. You fight him with the Word of God, right? You see, previously there had been translations of the Bible into German, but they were from the Latin, often cumbersome, often... You're all scholars in your thinking, aren't you? That's a requirement to come to this conference. Do you know that the Latin translation, when Jesus said, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand, it says, do penance, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And that set the church off on a whole idea of penance for centuries. The importance of a good translation. So what Luther did is he translated it into German. Now the rest of the Old Testament, the Old Testament took the rest of his life, and he had help for that. But Luther's translation was so interesting because it was of a German that the Germans could actually understand most of them because they have all these dialects of German that were, and his New Testament unified, unified the spoken language of Germany. It was something like the King James Version of the Bible for us. Hugely important. There are whole books written that said if Luther had done nothing else but translate the Bible into German, he'd have gone down in history as a great German. And of course, he did a lot of other things too. But let me talk to you a little bit about Luther and the devil. You know, sometimes uh, we misinterpret what the medievals believed about Satan. For example, you say, well, you know, in medieval times, they drew the devil and he had a tail and so forth. And we say, you know, they had such primitive views of the devil. Listen, the medievals understood the devil with more clarity and more biblical understanding than you and me. The reason that they drew the devil with a tail is to mock him, because they believed that the devil was so proud that there was one thing he could not stand, and that was mockery. But it is there in the Wartburg Castle, Luther tells us, I mean, he suffered from Ringing in the ears, he says, the ringing in my ears is as loud as the bells of Halle and Wittenberg. He suffered from gout. He suffered from sleeplessness. He suffered from huge depression, huge conflict with the devil, because the devil would come to him and say, so, you think you're the only guy who's right? Standing against a thousand years of church history, you're above the Pope, your conscience is above the Pope, you really think that you're right? And so Luther believed that the devil primarily, his primary work is to cause doubt in our hearts. Now, we must understand that. There are poltergeists who move things around in your kitchen and so forth, possibly. And Luther had that experience when he was in Wittenberg. He said that the devil often would shuffle things around in their apartment, which, by the way, I have been in. And a tour guide actually allowed me to open up one of Katie Luther's cupboards. It was empty, but anyway, I did it. And, and Luther said, that didn't bother him. 
And you know, that's true. My sister was a missionary in Africa, and uh, she had this house that she lived in, and every so often, footsteps would walk across the roof, and nobody was there. And she just had to go to sleep. If that's all that you can do, devil, I'm going to sleep despite the noise. But Luther said that what the devil does is always attack God's word. And you know, of course, the story of how the devil would come to Luther and say, Luther, look at all of your sins. And this is true. Luther would write beneath him. He'd speak to the devil and say, devil, you don't know half. You left some out. There are sins in my life that God knows about that you haven't even written down. And by the way, devil, how righteous are you? Where's your list of sins? And then Luther would say beneath them, the blood of Jesus Christ, God's son, cleanses us from all sin. Imagine the freedom that Luther had when he could say, my sins do not belong to me, they belong to Jesus. And that was what Luther did there in Wittenberg, I mean in uh, the Wartburg Castle. Well, a lot of other things happen. The Reformation begins to explode, and pretty soon you have whole cities going with the Reformed faith, all of them, and so forth. So Luther is under a ban. The Augsburg Conference happens, and Charles is personally there. Charles trying to bring about unity with the Protestants. Why? Because he needed their support in the war with the Turks. Luther did not attend at Augsburg. His sidekick, Melanchthon, was there. Luther hid himself in, the, in uh, not the Wartburg Castle, but um, an another castle in Germany, which doesn't come immediately to mind, but uh, Kohlenberg Castle. And uh, it is there probably that he wrote, Ein fester Burg ist unsere Gott. And you probably have sung it in English, a mighty fortress is our God. And uh, a man who wrote all of these hymns, who wrote all of these books, got involved in politics uh, in, in interesting ways. What I'd like to do now is to give you some uh, takeaways of the Reformation. All of you are taking notes, and you're especially going to take notes the next hour that we meet together. So first of all, number one, what the Reformation teaches us and could I say before I give you the one, two, three, four, five, six, that God uses imperfect people? I mean, Luther did some things. I mean, his writings against the Jews and all that you can learn about also in this interesting book whose title is Rescuing the Gospel. <laughs> Thought I'd throw that in. Let's give you some takeaways of the Reformation. Number one, the power of God's word. The power of God's word. Luther's translation into German. Once the German people had the Bible, the shackles of the church uh, could no longer hold them bound. And Luther once made a statement, even though he was so busy, he said, you know, he said, I just drank beer here in Wittenberg with my friend Almsdorf, and I let the word do the work. Well, that isn't exactly true because he did a lot of work, but it was the word that did the work, and now a personal word. I told you yesterday about my parents. They were Germans. They were brought up in the Ukraine, but they came to Canada independently. My father had been converted. My mother wanted to find out how she could be saved. She was baptized a Lutheran, but knew that salvation did not come through baptism. She attended a little church a half mile from where she worked, and she heard the gospel and was gloriously converted. Sometime afterward, all that she knew about my father is she had heard him pray. And she said, you know, that man knows God. He asked if he could walk her home, and she said yes. And on the way, he asked whether she would marry him. She said she'd think about it, but in less than three weeks they were married. And young people, do not use my parents as an example in this regard. I'm only telling you the way it was, not necessarily the way it should have been. But they lived together for 77 years, and they were godly. And my ministry today is a direct result of their prayers, I believe. But here's the reason I mention it. Every morning right after breakfast, I don't think we missed more than two or three times a year they would read to us from the German Bible. That's where I learned any verses that I know. And one day as a kid, I opened their Bible, and what does it say there? Martin Luther translation. 
Now, of course, it had been updated just like the King James has, but the impact of God's word, absolutely huge. Second, the priesthood of the believer. The priesthood of the believer. If everybody gets the same righteousness, it transformed worship. You didn't have to go to a priest now and ask him to pray for you. You pray. You're a priest before God. You're standing on the same righteousness as anybody else. You all get the same righteousness. You come directly to God. It undercut the power of the papacy, the power of the priesthood, and individuals now could come to God. And it transformed work. You see, in those days, in those days, a righteous work or a good work was considered what the priest asked you to do. Say Hail Marys, do a good deed, do something. Now, said Luther, if you're a priest before God, and if all things are to be done for the glory of God, as the Bible says they should be, washing a floor. You wash that full floor for the glory of God. It is something that pleases God because you are a priest before God and you're doing it for God. I love the way in which Luther said things. He said, God milks cows. But he says he uses a milkmaid to do it. But it's God milking. God says, I want that cow milked. You milk it for me and you honor me. I go milk the cow for you. I was a farm boy one time and used to milk cows. I'm glad that God led me into other phases of work. <laughs> but hey, you got to milk cows, do it to the glory of God. It changed the view of work. Now, absolutely critical, you're taking notes. God wants you to. I hope you can accept that with the uh, sense of humor that I intended. It planted the seed of freedom of religion. This is so critical. In those days, there was no freedom of religion. Heretics were put to death. Look at what happened to Huss. Heretics were always put to death. When Luther stood there in Worms and says, my conscience is above the Pope, and my conscience, by the way, is taken captive by the word of God, and you ask, Pastor Lutzer, what do we need at this time of American history when we're floundering around in every respect? I'll tell you what we need. We need believers whose consciences are taken captive by the word of God. Do I have an amen? Amen. 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 Five of you, that's good. <laughs> the seeds of freedom of religion. I once gave a a lecture on the history of freedom of religion in Europe. Europe didn't really have freedom of religion until the Peace of Westphalia in 1648, and, and the freedom of religion was a battle that was taking place. First of all, the Lutherans were given freedom of religion, but then not the Calvinists, and certainly not the Anabaptists that we're going to hear about, but eventually they got freedom of religion. But the whole idea was planted by Luther. And it took a while to work itself out. But now people said, I don't have to be captive to the Pope and to the teachings of the papacy because my conscience is important. Taken captive. Five, the need for courage. The need for courage. Oh, I think that's one of the reasons that I like history. That's one of the reasons that I admire uh, Luther, even though I disagree with him on some things, and that is that I love the idea that there was a time when truth mattered. Now, here's what has happened, and I talked to your pastor about this over dinner yesterday as we were talking about John Knox. There was a time when all that mattered was truth and love. Oh, you know, let's not, let's not love. Let's just be truthful and uh, today, it's the opposite. Oh, we have to be so loving, and we can't offend anybody. Listen, if you don't want to offend anybody, you're not going to share the gospel, because the gospel ultimately is offensive. Now, don't share it in an offensive way, but the fact is that the gospel carries its own offense. And so, we are so concerned about the way in which we are going to be viewed that we as Americans are mamby-pamby. We hide our faith. 
because where there is fear, there is silence. And I don't want this person next to me to think of the fact that I am some Bible thumper because I go to this college park church, and, and I don't want him to know that. And, uh, and furthermore, you know, he's going to think I voted for Trump if I begin to <laughs> do this. And so I am just not going to get involved in this. Because this is the only time I'll have this to say to you, I'm going to say it. Jesus said, blessed is your name, blessed are you. If your name, and I'm translating the Greek literally here now, is cast out as being evil because of me. And I am not saying we should be obnoxious. We should be loving and broken and humble above all people. But we also have to be clear regarding the gospel. Now, I'm going to say something I'll probably say here Sunday morning. So once again, God, if you come Sunday morning, as I hope you do, it's because God uh, said uh, you needed to hear this twice. (laughs) When was Luther saved? Was he saved there in the monastery when he was confessing his sins every day for hours at a time? Of course not. There are millions of people who are going to go to confession, and they will not have the assurance of salvation. Even if the past is cared for, Tomorrow is another day of uncertainty. Luther was saved when he understood the gospel, that if we stop trusting ourselves entirely with no works, and we'll talk about this when we speak about Calvin the next time, and we trust God in uh, Jesus in his entirety, that's why the Reformation is not only sola fide, which I'm preaching on here tomorrow, but Solus Christus, Christ alone, and uh, sola scriptura, we just heard it a few moments ago, the scriptures alone. If I trust Christ, I become a member of his family forever, and the righteousness that he gives me is going to take me from here all the way to heaven. One of the first doctrines that Luther gave up was the doctrine of purgatory because purgatory says nobody really dies righteous enough to go into heaven. Well, a few people do, but they're the saints and all. But the ordinary people like us, we're not, so we have to go to the fires of purgatory to be purged until we're good enough to go into heaven. Now, said Luther, if the righteousness of Jesus Christ is applied to me, I can go from this life and arrive in heaven and be welcomed in heaven as if I am Jesus because I'm clothed in his righteousness. Amen. Pretty weak amen, I'd say, for a Saturday crowd. Do we have a clap for God here at this point? So that's the story of Luther in brief. Huge figure stands between the old world and the new. As a result of him, the whole map of Europe, not just religiously but politically, is totally changed. And we still live with some of the changes today, and we'll be talking about that in the next hour. May I pray with you, and then Joe will come up and give you a word. Father, we want to thank you today that the gospel of Jesus Christ is the power of God. We thank you for the freedom of knowing that our sins don't belong to us. They belong to Jesus because we've received him as our sin bearer. So we ask, O God, that even this morning, if there are those here who have never savingly believed on Christ, cause them to believe for your glory. May they reach out right now and say, Jesus, I receive you as my Savior. I receive your righteousness. And... I acknowledge my sinfulness and my unrighteousness. Grant that, O God, we pray for your people. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.